Right, <clears throat> we're looking at BibleStudyManuals.net, K96.htm. We're raising objections to the insistence of evolutionists that the blood clotting system could actually evolve over a long period of time. We discovered that it would take uh, many, many, many more times, uh, innumerable years past the time that the uh, universe is considered to be old. Thousand billion years. But we look at finally these other objections. Looking at each different system component of the blood clotting system, it take longer than the universe is old. How do we get to the objections raised so far? Are not the most serious, although they're very uh, serious. And they destroy the idea of evolution. An intelligent designer is the only answer. The most serious and perhaps the most obvious concerns irreducible complexity. And uh, Behe, the author of the Darwin's Black Box, says, I emphasize that a natural selection, the engine of Darwinian evolution, only works if there is something to select, something that is useful right now, not in the future. Suppose, for purposes of discussion, as might occur in a typical Darwinian model, no blood clotting appears until at least the third step. The formation of tissue factor at the first step is thus unexplained, since it would then be sitting around with nothing to do. In the next step, post-thrombin, popping up already endowed with the ability to bind tissue factor, which somehow activates it, the pro poor prothrombin would be also twiddling its thumbs with nothing to do until at last a hypothetical thrombin receptor appears at the third step and fibrinogen falls from heaven at step four. Magic! But that's not how evolution works. Plasminogen appears in one step, but its activator TPA doesn't appear until two steps later. Stewart factor is introduced in one step, but whiles away its time during nothing until its activator proconvertin appears in the next step. This is all designed. This is not accidental. And somehow tissue factors decide that this is the complex it wants to bind. Virtually every step of the suggested pathway faces similar problems, innumerable ones, too long for the universe to have existed. Simple words like the activator doesn't appear until two steps later may not seem impressive until you ponder the implications. Since two proteins, the proenzyme and its activator, are both required for one step in the pathway, then the odds of getting both the proteins together are roughly the square of the odds of getting one protein. We calculated the odds of getting TPA alone to be one-tenth to the eighteenth power. The odds of getting TPA and its activator together would be about one-tenth to the thirty-sixth power. This is horrendously large, a horrendously large number. Such an event would not be expected to happen, even if the universe's 10 billion year life were compressed into a single second and relived every second for 10 billion years. It even goes beyond that. But the situation is actively, actually much worse. If a protein appeared in one step with nothing to do, then mutation and natural selection would tend to eliminate it. And since it is doing nothing critical, its loss would not be detrimental. That's how evolution works has to be useful immediately. The production of the gene and protein would cost energy that other animals weren't spending. So producing the useless protein would, at least to some marginal degree, be detrimental. Darwin's mechanism of natural selection would actually hinder the formation of irreducible, com irreducibly complex systems such as the clotting cascade. The bottom line is that clusters of proteins have to be inserted all at once into the cascade. This can be done only by the guidance of an intelligent agent. Now, we have a new subject. you got to get that Darwin's black box, because it not only talks about the blood clotting system, but the, the heart, the lungs, the brain, and everything else are even more irreducibly complex, and they all have to work together. If the brain isn't working, you don't have a living mechanism. If the heart and lungs don't work, likewise. Blood class and likewise. All the other things, the immune system, likewise. Well, Henry Morris states, evolution, a house divided. If a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. 
That goes for evolution and all kinds of things. Evolutionists ardently defend their house against outsiders, but squabble, squabble vigorously with each other inside the house. In the article, we, we present a, a collage of recent quotes from evolutionists attacking different aspects of their own basic theory. Lest we be accused of out-of-context quoting, we emphasize that each person quoted is a committed evolutionist, even though his remark may make him sound like a creationist. Point one, about cosmic evolution. Now, the standard evolutionary concept for the origin of the universe is the Big Bang Theory, but many eminent astronomers flatly reject it. Both the Big Bang model and the theoretical side of elementary particle physics rely on numerous highly speculative assumptions. But if there was no Big Bang, how and when did the universe begin? Alfin replies, it is only a myth that attempts to say how the universe came into being. One argument for the Big Bang Theory is the redshift, but Halton Arp and other leading astronomers say no. Arp maintains that quasars, for example, whose re large red shifts suggest that they are most the most distant objects in the universe, are actually no more distant than galaxies. <coughs> the evolution of life from non-life. It is commonly asserted that life evolved from non-living chemicals by purely naturalistic processes. However, a leading scientist in this field says, at present, all discussions on principal theories and experiments in the field either end in stalemate or in a confession of ignorance. This is amongst evolutionists. The problem is that the principal evolutionary processes from prebiotic molecules to progenitive Progenotes, 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 have not been proven by experimentation, and that the environmental conditions under which these processes occur are not known. Point three: the evolution of species. The standard Darwinian and neo-Darwinian theories of evolution argue that new species are developed by natural selection of random variations to fit changing environments. Many evolutionists today, however, are rejecting Darwinianism, even though they still cling to its evolution. One such scientist is Kenneth Hughes Hessel. The, the law of natural selection is not, I will maintain, science. It is an ideology, and a wicked one, and it has mu much interfered with our ability to perceive the history of life with clarity, as it has interfered with our ability to see one another with tolerance. The law of the survival of the fittest may be, therefore, a tautology in which fitness is defined by the fact of survival, not by independent criteria that would form the basis for a prediction. The belief system. <clears throat> human Evolution of human life. Much ado has been made about the Laotoli fossil footprints and Tankania, dated three and a half million years ago, supposedly proving that the Australopithecine ancestors of man walked erect. But the detailed study of the gates and footprints of modern people who walk barefooted indicate the Laotoli prints are much like those of Homo sapiens and were probably not produced by Lucy's relatives, reports R. Russell H. Tottle of the University of Chicago. It should be obvious that these footprints were made by true human beings. The only reason for rejecting this fact is the assumed three and a half million year age a long time, a time long before man is supposed to have evolved. Maybe you just change the time chart because it, it, the uh, age dating methods are suspect as well. The fossil evidence. The fossil record has traditionally been considered the best evidence for evolution, but the utter absence of true transitional forms continues to be an embarrassment. <clears throat> if we were to expect to find ancestors to or intermediates between higher, ta higher taxa, it would be in the rocks of late Precambrian to Ordovician times, Ordovician times, when the bulk of the world's higher animal taxa evolved. Yet transitional alliances are unknown or unconfirmed for any of the phyla or classes appearing then. We conclude that neither, neither of the contending theories of evolutionary change at the species level, phyletic gradualism or punctuated equilibrium, seem applicable to the origin of new body plants. Extinction versus special speciation. The evolutionists seem to unable to re realize 
the anomaly in the slow rate of speciation versus the high rate of species extinction. Today's rate of extinction can be estimated through various analytical techniques to be a minimum of 1,000 and possible several thousand species per year. It normally takes tens of thousands of years for a new terrestrial vertebrate or a new plant species to emerge fully. And even species with rapid turnover rates, notably insects, usually require centuries, if not millennia, to generate a new species. As far as observed, no new species are now being formed. It seems that evolution, if there is such a thing, is going in the wrong direction. Devolution, not evolution. Uniformitarianism. Although the history of the Earth and life has long been interpreted by the uniformitarian maxim, the present is the key to the past. More and more geologists are, are returning to catastrophism. Our science is too encumbered with uniformitarian concepts that project the modern Earth life system as a primary model for interpretation of evolution and extinction patterns in ancient eco ecosystems. Detailed paleoenvironmental data tell us that the past is the key to the present, not vice versa. One of the key evidences for a great age is the uniformitarian interpretation of evaporites, but this very term is misleading. In referring to an evaporite, the term begs the question as it implies desiccation. For clarity, geology needs a new term, namely precipitate rock, created by precipitation. Hence, rocks of the evaporitic facies could be precipitates, deposited by precipitation from a supersaturated solution. Precipitation is, of course, a much more rapid process than evaporation, thus canceling out the necessity for long ages of evaporation in favor of rapid precipitation. Now we have social harmfulness of evolution. Evolution is strongly complained when creationists point out that the historically evil influence of evolutionists. Many evolutionists, however, do recognize this fact. We were victims of a cruel social ideology that assumes that competition among individuals, classes, nations, or races is the natural condition of life. Well, war is okay. And that is also natural for the superior to dispossess the inferior. For, for the last century and more, this ideology has been thought to be a natural law of science, the mechanism of evolution, which was formulated most powerfully by Charles Darwin. <clears throat> I prefer the grace of God. Robert Proctor shows how the major German societies of physical anthropologists collaborated with the SS program of race hygiene in helping to make a racial policy. Eugene Fischer, the most distinguished of German physical anthropologists, regarded by many as the founder of human genetics, was particularly helpful in these efforts. But surely American physical anthropologists spoke out clearly against the Nazi perversion of their science. But they didn't. Scientific bigotry. Creationists are not the only ones who find it difficult to get a hearing from the scientific establishment. Even evolutionists who not, do not conform to the majority viewpoint in evolutionary dogma at a given time encounter the same bigotry through the so-called peer preview process. One of the most distinguished modern astronomers is Nobel Prize winner Hans Alphen, who espouses an alternative cosmology to the Big Bang. Here is his testimony. Even Nobel laureates must defer to the scientific establishment. He says, it has given me a serious disadvantage when I describe the phenomena according to this formulism. Most referees do not understand what I say and turn, to, turn down my papers. But the argument, all knowledgeable people agree that, with the tacit addition that by not agreeing your demonstrate, you demonstrate that you are a crank is not a valid argument in science. The scientific issues always were decided by Gallup polls and not by scientific arguments. Science will very soon be petrified forever. More on this later.